I love Google always starts with recipes. They really do. With yeah. any kind of new feature or example that they're trying to give. It's always recipes. Just get the thing. There's a lot of hungry people at Google. Uh, the robots told me to invest in this thing illegally. Well, so Reddit is full of nutters and chaos gremlins, right? Like, yeah, what's your point? Like, so now we have glue in our pizza and nobody goes to this restaurant. <laughs> There's films, video games, anything will get review bombed because, oh, it has a woman in the lead role yeah. or anything like that. I don't trust reviews online much anymore. People are mad <laughs> and wrong and trolls and chaos goblins. Don't trust people. Have we not learned anything from, oh, I don't know, the last 10,000 years of human history? Reddit is full of crazy people who want to mess with stuff. <laughs> yeah. I don't think just trust Reddit is a long-term <laughs> business strategy. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Search with Canda. I am one of your hosts, Jack Chambers Ward. We're back in the studio and I'm joined by Mark Williams Cook. Welcome Hi. back, Mark. Thank you. You've been flying all over the world, talking at conferences and stuff. By the time they hear this, you'll have been at another conference as well. You're doing lots of talks, lots of exciting things. It's conference season. It right? happens occasionally. And I don't get why there's a conference season. Yeah, we like, were talking about this yeah. the other day, weren't we? It's weird. And I was trying to explain this to my wife. Like, oh, wow, Mark's really traveling a lot. I was like, yeah, they all happen at once for some reason. Yeah. Throughout, weird. like, October, November time, all the kind of search conferences happen. It's very, very strange. Not not as much, though, as I saw uh, Mike King is actually... So he's joining us for SERPConf in Vienna on the 30th. But on the 30th, he's also in Amsterdam Play doing, doing a... Semrush talk and then immediately flying to Vienna. Oh my God. So I'm traveling, but not as much <laughs> as some. <laughs> uh, that will have already happened by the time you hear this, listeners. But uh, yeah, you can go and check out SerpConf. I'm fascinated to. We get a little sneak peek of one of your slides in, in this podcast. Just the one. So we'll, we'll, we'll have a little sneak peek of that because we're going to be talking about AI organized search results. That's general kind of stuff, kind of covering recipes, and also the AI organization of the Google Shopping feed as well. We're also going to be talking about how Redditors have been trolling AI overviews with fake restaurant reviews, and we'll also be talking about the unfortunate inaccuracies of some finance-related queries where AI overviews is having some trouble. Huge thank you to SE Ranking for sponsoring this week's episode of Search with Candor. SE Ranking is the company behind the powerful and intuitive SEO platform trusted by millions of agencies, businesses, and SEO professionals since 2013. With a robust toolkit, SE Ranking empowers SEO professionals around the world to excel at executing their strategies. Key features include the Rank Tracker, which provides accurate and up-to-date keyword rankings, as well as the competitive and keyword research tools that offer deep insights into market trends and competitor strategies. The platform's AI-powered SEO insights leverage advanced machine learning to deliver actionable recommendations, streamlining the process and letting you outrank your competition. The Backlink Checker and Monitoring tool enables you to analyze backlink profiles and monitor their status, ensuring you've got a very healthy link building strategy. SE Ranking have launched their AI Overviews Tracking feature. It's a brand new tool that allows you to track AI search engine snippets that will help you see how you stack up against your competitors in Google's AI Enhanced Search features. The tool supports you in identifying your rivals in the snippets, analyzing their content and detecting new opportunities for strategic decisions. Click the link in the video description down below or in the show notes if you're listening to this episode. And a huge thank you to SE Ranking for sponsoring us here at Search for the Candor. Optimizer is the modern PPC management software that is built by PPC people for PPC people. Optimizer contains everything you need to create, optimize, and automate high-performing paid campaigns across multiple platforms. As I just mentioned, we're going across platforms, and I think this is one of the best time-saving options and features when it comes to Optimizer. If you are advertising across multiple platforms, including Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook, then you need to be using these cross-platform tools. You can create reports, you can create shareable dashboards, you can share budgets and alerts across all of these platforms. If you are individually managing each of these things, you could save yourself a lot of time by using Optimizer's cross-platform tools. 
for monitoring. The alerts let you know when budgets have been exhausted or KPIs have been reached or missed. And when it comes to the rule engine, this allows you to set up custom rules to automate so many time consuming and manual tasks that are part of your paid campaigns. You can easily automate rules. Basically, if you can write your strategy or tactic down, you can automate it. It's that simple. This can be especially helpful in things like e-commerce when it comes to stopping overspending of a particular ad. This is something I know from personal experience. I have had an ad that has overspent and if I had used Optimizer, that would have saved my budget and saved my campaign in that instance. And I wish I'd used Optimizer at the time. You can also adjust bids and choose which products or ads are showing based on things like the weather and pretty much anything else you can put into a spreadsheet. It is fully customizable and automated so you can choose when ads start and which products are showing depending on the time of year, depending on the weather and so many other factors. It's all automated and makes the process so much easier. To sum it up, Optimizer is the award-winning all-in-one PPC toolkit that makes managing paid search easier, faster, and less prone to error. It puts you back in the control of your campaigns by allowing you to create and deploy your own automations across multiple ad platforms. You can start your 14-day free trial by going to optimizer.com. That's O-P-T-M-Y-Z-R.com. You can also click the link in the show notes. And if you want to see Optimizer in action, you can book a personalized demo with one of Optimizer's experts by clicking the link in the show notes as well. So you can get a 14 day trial or book a demo at no cost to you. Like I said, go and click the link in the show notes or the video description down below. And a huge thank you to Optimizer for sponsoring Search with Canda. It's an AI filled episode because welcome to search in 2024, <laughs> right. basically. It's unavoidable. And I actually quite like it when we get to talk about specifics. And because I feel like it's t it's touched on in a very broad sense of like, oh, is an AI bad or aren't LLMs n not working this way and working that way and all that kind of thing. But let's jump straight in and have a look at some new ways to ask questions in Google. Yeah. Uh, briefly, before we before we started, we were just looking at the AI-generated summary from Google themselves here. And I love that it says, AI organized search results for a more comprehensive experience. <laughs> um, Getting quite meta there. Yeah, yeah. And AI I enjoy thing, it, though. I, I, love a, I love an AI-generated summary. AI-generated summaries are very handy. I know that's the thing we've talked about a lot on the show, where it's that that's such a classic obvious case of an LLM that's going to save you time that's going to really do the the little bit of work that will help you speed up your processes and all that kind of stuff uh, they talk about some new ways to search in lens that's not what I'm going to focus on that, that might be interesting to you I'll, I'll post links for everything in the show notes down below or the video description if you're watching on YouTube we'll scroll right past that and we'll look at your search results page organized with AI and this was something that Eric Hoover and I discussed about four or five weeks ago now, six weeks ago, something like that, where we were talking all about AI tools and how to use them in search and a lot of great recommendations for Eric's workflow and content creation and the kind of LLM stuff and GPTs he's using and all that kind of stuff. But we did say, oh, is AI going to be the end of search? Is SEO dead again? The classic conversation, right? And Eric specifically said, I don't think AI overviews is the end of search. That's not the bit I'm scared of. It's an AI organized SERP that really scares me. Dun, dun, dun. Well, Eric, <laughs> here we go, mate, because, yeah. Uh, to quote Google here, I'll briefly read for those of you who aren't watching on YouTube or Spotify. Uh, earlier this year, we previewed how AI can help you explore and discover a wider range of results from the web for those questions that may be open-ended or have no single right answer. Like if you're searching for a vegetarian appetizer, hello, that sounds, that sounds like something I might search for, to make for a dinner party. This week, we're rolling out search results pages organized with AI in the US because the US gets all the fun stuff to begin with, mm -hmm. right? Beginning with recipes and meal inspiration on mobile, you'll now see a full page experience with relevant results organized just for you. You can easily explore content and perspectives from across the web, including articles, videos, forums, and more all in one place. Correct me if I'm wrong, that just sounds like a search result page. <laughs> Including articles, videos, forums, and more. It's like, yeah, you're describing a search results page that has existed for 20 plus years. So they have a little, if you're you're watching on YouTube or watching on Spotify, there is a little 
gif that's playing around and showing the kind of things you can do with this. Cool, I guess. Like, I don't know how this will then roll out to other things outside of recipes. This seems like a very focused example. And as far as I can tell, nobody else has shown any examples of this, despite them saying it's being tested in the US. I couldn't find any other examples. We had a brief search, uh, search around on social media and stuff. What are your thoughts, Mark, at this initial kind of reveal of personalized recipes on your search results? I just, as a side note, I love Google always starts with recipes. They really do, don't they? Like with yeah. any kind of new feature or example that they're trying to give. It's always recipes. Just get the thing is a lot of hungry people at Google. Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's like, I don't know, there's there's data to support that like people are searching for recipes. It must be like one of the most searched things. I don't know. So I like it. Like, which probably yeah. will be an unpopular opinion with, <laughs> with SEOs. I think for users, um, from a tech point of view, I think it's a good use of that kind of technology. Um, I think the experience is pretty nice in terms of they're just surfacing a lot of the information you need right next to each other. And, you know, a bit like how Amazon's been doing with their reviews. I really like how they summarize, you know, yes. there's like, 8,000 reviews on something. <laughs> I think being able to say, here are the common... Overall, customers say it's great quality, yeah. but is the, sometimes it's the wrong color yeah. or wrong size like, or whatever. Like, yeah, that's yeah. really helpful, right? I mean, that completely ignores, obviously, the elephant in the room about where did they get this information from yeah. and how are they rewarding the people that actually figure out how to make these recipes <laughs> and you know cook them and write about them and put them out there yeah, yeah which is but to me that's like a separate discussion um is an important discussion but <laughs> the i think the unfortunate truth is that it doesn't matter to the user sure yeah, i think we've yeah. seen that enough before this is like a a path of least resistance in that people are like this is nice and they're just going to use it because yeah. it's convenient yeah, so the example here, I think I'm going to highlight a couple of things. It mentions it's organized by AI right at the top there. Obviously, so much of the SERP features are now labeled with AI and stuff like that. That makes sense. The interesting bit for me is when they they scroll down and it shows the what you, ingredients do you have in the fridge and you can tick the different things so like, oh, yeah, I want to make something with tomatoes. I want to make something with avocado. That has been a multitude of different like health apps, food apps, recipe apps, websites all this kind of stuff and obviously that is a thing that is going to t essentially get rid of those like you can just use an llm to do that now you can type in a bunch of stuff into chat gpt gemini copilot whatever you're using and say hey i've got these five ingredients i want to make a lunch meal for myself what's what can i do what are the options and it's fascinating to me that we don't really hear the stories of oh yeah that app is now just out of business because it's been replaced by everything else in the world that is powered by LLMs. And now you can just do it on a search result page without even yeah. having to install the chat GPT app on your phone or anything like that. It's these little bits where, like you said, where are they getting this information from? It's like, yeah, sure, there's some citations. They mentioned the the sources there for different websites and they link to like guide articles and stuff like that and, and listicles, which is a whole thing Google has been moving to do recently as well. But having that functionality of actually being able to pick and filter stuff. Explore by ingredient is the example it says here. And you tick it, and then you can follow the find any recipes featuring these ingredients, mm. and that takes you through to another, like, expanded page. So that kind of search journey changes in a way where you're going from that kind of conversational chat GPT stuff to now this is a very visual... This is way more visual than most uh, chat GPT stuff, most, you know, Gemini, copilot -y kind of results. I, I agree with you. I quite like the images. I think it gives a clear idea of what to expect from those things. Is it a thing that is going to expand outside of recipes? I can imagine it moving to other stuff. Oh, for sure. Because for the, sure. the next thing we're going to talk about is the shopping feed, which is a much bigger deal for, I'm sure, plenty of listeners and viewers who are working in e-commerce and are keeping their Google shopping feeds up to date. So cool with the recipe stuff i am intrigued to see where it goes from here how much it gets to roll out all that kind of stuff is this the inkling towards doomsday and ranking doesn't matter and no longer exists and every serp in the world is personalized specifically to you who knows that seems absolutely crazy and not like a thing that 
Google, even Google would be able to fund or power. But uh, yeah, let's do Let's talk about some shopping stuff. So there's a great little article here from The Verge who have done some fantastic work covering Google recently. They had a lot of the discussion with Sundar and the team over at Google when Google I.O. and launching AI and all that kind of stuff. They did some brilliant interviews we've talked about in the past a few months ago. And this is essentially Google Shopping Feed getting a for you style personalized feed. And they compare it to similar feeds like TikTok and Instagram and threads and like YouTube shorts and all that kind of stuff, which is often how I try to describe Google Discover to people. It's like, it's kind of like social media, but it's a search result. So mm, yeah. Just it's not like the X for you feed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And uh, so this is kind of customizing it based on your search history, your shopping habits, even your YouTube search results, which I find very interesting. And it will include things like recommendations, specific deals, all that kind of stuff, and really kind of pers personalizing it to you and your the kind of products you're interested in. For me, this is a much bigger deal than the recipes thing. Would you agree in, in a way, Mark? This feels like a bigger shift for e-commerce than like, oh no, a few recipe articles are not getting traffic. This feels like a big, potentially a big shift for e-commerce. <laughs> I'm on the fence, to be honest, be okay. because I think with the with the things like recipes, I'm not sure with information like that how much brand matters. Yeah, because it it's you know to use recipe as an example of that type of thing, it's just some information that you need, um, which obviously those sites were finding ways to monetize, etc. I think kind of the moat that you have in ecom is brand does really matter mm. to people. So while I think it's potentially good for challenger brands. I think you've still got that loyalty associated with your product, the quality, why people buy it. Um, that is going to persist whether you're shown in like an AI organized type of result or whether it's just, again, ranking your pages. And that's what's going to be surfaced, you know, when... Google's creating this extra information like about products and, you know, what is popular. Um, some reservations as well about the like YouTube search history, things like that. Yeah. Because um, for instance, like my Spotify uh -oh. um, is polluted because I would listen to a specific kind of music when I go running. Oh yeah, sure. For hours and hours and hours. I, I have had my most listened to artist is like battle fantasy music because I was <laughs> using it in the background of my Dungeons and Dragons yeah. games. And I was like, I don't think it is. I mean, by hours, it probably is. And I know Spotify, you can do the little like, filter this out of my algorithm type thing yeah. but you can't do that for google so <laughs> so i'm wondering yeah because yeah. like for google i have a like work profile sure. and yeah, a yeah. Same. home one same and i just don't know how many people will do that and how google will handle that i mean i'm sure that i'm sure they have a way um the other thing i think is just interesting from this point of view where google has an advantage is you know they've got people to give them all of these product feeds and um <clears throat> we didn't mention it about recipes mm. um you know there's been recipe ingredient schema for a long time yeah, that lists what the ingredients are so google's got a fairly good trustworthy base of that whereas llms say like chat gpt that are just trained on a large corpus aren't actually processing that structured data yeah, in the yeah. same way they're just taking it in and for their you know tokenization so i think that's an advantage that google's going to have as we see these different types of product and recommendation i don't know how we're going to call them like a kind of an ai powered recommendation engine almost yeah, that's a big yeah. advantage google's got they've got that grounding of we understand the web better than you do yeah i think it's a i think recommendation engine is a really interesting way of thinking about it and like you mentioned with the recipe side of things from a user perspective this is probably going to be pretty helpful. Like in theory, again, we always talk about the people who are not like us and like you viewers and listeners are not switched into the digital marketing sphere, the SES sphere, what Google is doing. You know, you have a, co a conversation with anyone who is not in this industry and ask like, what do you think about the recent Google trial? And like, what Google yeah, trial? Right. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, have you noticed that AI things? And now AI overview seems to have kind of creeped into people actually reacting, normies reacting to the the bad stuff that's happening on Google. I would be fascinated to see, and I know we've been talking a lot about the the kind of trust that people are 
losing in Google essentially after decades and decades of it being the source of information. Would this kind of thing not necessarily sway people back in that direction, but this seems like a pretty helpful thing if you are rather than being thrown a bunch of stuff that is not in your kind of colors, not in your size, et cetera, et cetera. I find that very frustrating when I'm searching for stuff and me being a large man searching for specific sizes that need to fit me and be like, we have all of these except your size. I'm like, why did you serve me that result? And I specifically searched for that. And hopefully this means a little bit of personalization. They also mentioned the sort of AR stuff that they're doing with like the virtual try on stuff as well. This is all tying into Google lens as well. So you can like literally take a photo of something, tag it and essentially that will search it for you and then that will likely feed into your personalized shopping feed. So even the photos that you're taking and using with lens, combining all of the things with mom and Bert that they talked about, we talked about months and months and months ago, this then feeds into your shopping feed as a whole. But I know there's a whole kind of sub part of e-commerce where people are optimizing their shopping feed and stuff like that. And I think you're totally right when it comes to that structured data stuff you're essentially handing Google this on a silver platter, right? I talked about this with uh, Dave Ojeda quite a few months ago now, why Google loves structured data so much. They're getting it all packaged up nicely and explained to them rather than having to pass a bunch of stuff and understand it and read it and pull it out from context and blah, 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 blah. You're giving them all of that context. And in theory, and I think it was a great point Dave made on the show, like I said, many months ago, it's like, that's so much cheaper for Google to go through and find structured data stuff as it can just pull out the different parameters and variables and, and pluck it out, basically, rather than having to crawl and understand and render and all the extra bits that come with it. So I can totally see why they're leaning into the feed side of things, especially with, as I kind of joked about with the fully personalized SERPs, like, this is an expensive thing to do. You, yeah. It's, it's going to be a very for a better phrase, energy heavy, money heavy, expensive thing to do from both perspectives rather than just serving your standard SERPs. So I can totally see why they're starting off with a shopping feed that allows them to kind of get that data nice and easily because you're already passing them that information. And monetize it. And monetize it to hell, exactly, yeah. As, as we know, Google loves making money. <laughs> I mean, that is one of the, so from the slides that I did at um, Search and Stuff, and I'm going to be giving at CertConf, this is what I was talking about in terms of the future and predicting what Google is doing. So we gave <clears throat> this diagram, which is kind of the end of it, where Google's kind of the out al the algorithm or Google strategically has a target. And obviously they talk to us about things like helpful content, um, you know, making good content. And yep. some people do that, you know, and then they realize that they don't rank, <laughs> even though yeah, they've done yeah. that. And the point I've been making is there's all kinds of forces that tug on this strategic goal of Google, the biggest one being making ungodly amounts of money, of course. <laughs> um, and one of the things we've learned throughout Google's history is they like keeping people on their SERP. Um, you know, they have an argument for it in terms of helpfulness to the user because they're like, oh, it's lower latency. You know, it's better You're engagement. You're not then clicking off and having to sign into a thing. Yeah, We're optimizing the customer load. experience. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact is, if it's on their SERP, they can monetize it better Correct. and they can monetize it at a higher margin. Because if you come, Google sends you to my website, even if I'm running Google ads, I'm getting a cut of yep. those clicks. Whereas if Google keeps you on the SERP and you click on the same ad, Google's going to make more money. Yep. Um, so it is of zero surprise <laughs> that we see more features, um, helpful or not, that are keeping people on the actual SERP for longer, you know, and it's they've done this with all kinds of verticals with flights yeah. and you know, even and basic stuff like weather. And they've gotten in a lot of trouble for it. We we I talked yeah. with Gus Pelodra a couple of months ago all about the Digital Markets Act, which was a complete rebuttal to you mentioned flights being a perfect example. Yeah. All of the accommodation stuff, the hotel stuff, the flights, the travel, all that stuff that has been built in as SERP features where you can literally book your flights, book your accommodation through Google as essentially like a weird third party travel agent y kind of thing, but they don't disclose that because again, like you said, well they can make some money from it and they can <laughs> chuck some ads on the SERPs. 
Google has gotten in a lot of trouble, and this ties in obviously into the trial I joked about earlier, the whole antitrust trial where mm. a federal judge declared them as a monopoly of the search industry because they keep linking to their own stuff and favoring their own products. And there's been this whole conversation where Google has got into the habit of just like, well, if you want to do this thing, use Google Shopping. If you want to check maps, go to Google Maps. And I was I was chatting to um, one of our account managers here in the office earlier, kind of catching them up to date. I'm like, oh, what's the search news? They were scrolling through core updates, our newsletter, funnily enough, and I was having a chat with them. And I was saying like, so how does like that work in terms of what's going to happen in the future and stuff? I was like, that's an excellent question. <laughs> Can you imagine where you type in, I need to tra travel from Norwich to Vienna and you get results on Bing Maps and Apple Maps and also Google Maps on a Google SERP. Like, that is so alien to me as a concept that they would have to give equal weight to competitors' equivalent mm. products on their SERPs. And I know, I think it was the last time we were here, you mentioned the whole people are going to take the, the path of least resistance you mentioned oh, yeah. earlier as well. Well, oh, yeah. Google is the default on so many devices. And even if it's not made the default, most people will just default to it anyway because of human behavior and psychology and stuff. It's not even about the technology. And, well, you can go into your settings and change your default search. And it's like, yeah, you know no one. You have the data <laughs> for that. No one does that. And I'd be fascinated to see how this kind of stuff, when we're seeing Google, like you said, focusing more on, well, here's a whole... SERP, uh, the whole side of the SERPs, Google Shopping, that is now essentially pushing you towards their products and their things that used to, like mm. you said, Mark, they can then monetize. Isn't this just kind of like going against all of the antitrust stuff and the DMA stuff? And is this not flying directly in the face of all of that? I think it's going to take a <laughs> while to enforce any of this, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the, go through appeals. I yep. think we talked about this before. We did, yeah. yeah. So. There's, there's no chance that... I know people freaking out, like, by 2025, everything's going to be, they'll no longer own Android. I'm like, that's not going to happen anytime. Google is already appealing it, and it's a whole long legal process. And speaking of legal processes, I know Google likes to kind of bash us over the head with YMYL. It's a phrase we hear many times on this show. You go to a SERP conference, somebody's going to be talking about any kind of thing where it's YMYL, it's your money or your life. And the way that we uh, com I communicate this to clients, the way I chat to people at conferences and stuff is always that if it dramatically affects the important things in your life, i.e. the way you make money and feed yourself and feed your family, or your health and that health of your family members and, and things like that, Google is going to look at it with a bit more scrutiny mm. and take it a bit more seriously. So hopefully, you'd hope. You'd hope. in theory, you don't get a bunch of rubbish. Um, <laughs> we, we joked about the uh, stick your fingers down your throat <clears throat> example that I always bring up when the title apocalypse happened and yeah. it all went wrong. Well, we have an example of that, thankfully, with some more financial advice. This is a brilliant study. I recommend you go and check out the link in the show notes if you haven't already. This is 43% of finance-related searches are inaccurate on Google's AI overviews. Like I said, credit to the college investor here for doing a fantastic uh, study. I'll scroll through and kind of have a look at a few bits. If you want to come and watch us on Spotify or YouTube, it's a, it's a pretty visual thing, but we'll kind of talk through it. What's your initial reaction, I guess, Mark, to 43% of finance-related searches are inaccurate? I mean, I wish I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> just a just a cold acceptance of like yeah seems yeah. about right so, to me <laughs> i mean it, the title you know and i think we'll go into it is is inaccuracy is not necessarily flat out wrong correct but yeah. that has been my experience i believe the stat is 12 percent of them were flat yeah. out completely wrong which which is kind of my experience when you start getting into the weeds of stuff and asking more complex questions that's when the wheels start to fall off yeah. LMs. they specifically say it's like nuanced questions about like yeah taxes and investments and all that kind of stuff like yeah no one understands that stuff so that's the kind of thing people search for so i, I yeah. saw a really great quote by Brittany muller in a presentation um on x i think the screenshot was which said by definition content produced by llms is average <laughs> and, I, and I really liked that because obviously it has kind of a, so smart, a double that's meaning. So but that's so clever. You know, you're never going to get like an excellent type of answer that's, you know, so using this is, I think, is a really great example because, you know, if, 
financial advice with tax laws, with you know it being uh, subjective to where you live, yeah. and all these all these variables, which is why you know in the UK. Um, you know, there's regulation around giving financial advice because yeah, you absolutely. need to be qualified yeah. because the, you mess up people's your life. lives. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, there's a brilliant example here. You mentioned location and stuff mattering. Oh boy, does that matter in the US where each state is essentially its own country and has its own rules and stuff. And the, the author here, uh, Robert Farrington, talks about a conversation he was having with someone on LinkedIn and the other person was like, yeah, of course, you can do this thing in California as of January 2024. And Robert's like, I don't think so. It's allowed federally, but that's not how the US works. And state laws and legislations often will supersede federal stuff unless specific judges step in and all this kind of stuff. US legal stuff melts my brain every time I even try to think about it. Not your cup of tea. Not my cup of tea, exactly. <laughs> Very much so. I, I'm glad I live in a relatively simple, small little country with only a handful of little complications around England, Wales, Scotland, yeah. all that kind of stuff. There's 12 laws and they're good. Exactly. And they were written in 1565, <laughs> like before America was a thing. Um, but the fact that something can be true in California, but not true in Texas, and then a third variant in Washington, and then completely different in Massachusetts. Ah, you're serving non-location specific results using AI overviews. Mm. They are not fueled by location. So you can get very clunky, very wrong, very quickly. And exactly as you said just now, Mark, like that's where the nuance matters, right? Where, well, it seems like this works. And I can't imagine, well, I can probably, there's going to be a case somewhere where some guy did some fraud and was like, well, I searched it on Google and it said it was fine. And they get a big screenshot of an AI overview saying like, well, uh, Your Honor, the AI overview told me to do it. It's like the robots told me to invest in this thing illegally. Like, well. That's right. Yeah, that tiny little <laughs> disclaimer, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. This is experimental. Don't don't trust us with anything. It's like maybe don't give answers for very yeah. important queries. Then. I mean, we talked about this on, on Edge of the Web about why I'm well and, yes. and this story and talked about just to me the apps just... <laughs> The state where you can, at the top of your SERP, for this kind of query, generate an answer. Yep. And then in really small text underneath it, basically say... By the way, it might be inaccurate and you might lose your house and your job, but don't worry about it. It's yeah, fine. just just <laughs> put it right at the top, but then have a little disclaimer like, yeah, that might all be totally wrong. Like It's wild. Don't that, put that, it at that, the that top That is becoming then. a normalized thing is absolutely crazy. There should be like a button that hides <laughs> it and the button says... If you're really lazy but want an answer that might be wrong, click here to see it. That's really interesting. So I like you, you're almost combining like GDPR, like <laughs> cookie regulations with AI over but stuff. Like nobody's you should have to fully consent. Nobody AI reads, is, is opt in. <laughs> nobody reads disclaimers. No, like famously everyone so. knows disclaimers yeah. are for cowards. Yeah, right. Yeah, don't read them. There's that. There's that <laughs> famous com uh, comic of like. If you had read all of the terms and conditions of all of the things that you do and use, like just your phone, it would take like two weeks to read all of the oh, terms and conditions. Oh, there's that the chap that read out the iPhone yes. end, end user life screen yes. and a stack of paper. Yeah. And it took it just, yeah, like 16 hours or something. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah. Nobody reads anything, any disclaimers or anything like that. And those are also pretty wobbly from a legal point of view, from what I understand where you can, especially on the internet, depending on like how big is the text, how bold is the text, how present is it from an initial click, or like do you have to scroll down to get the disclaimer? All those little nuances matter from a legal perspective. Yeah, really? Yes. I did not know that. Yeah, I thought yeah. you just kind of had to say it somewhere, and then you could be like, well, it says it. In fact, that that no, depends. No, my fault they didn't read. Exactly. That, 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 this ties in, I was kind of joking, obviously, about the opt-in to AI overviews thing, but mm. that is a lot how a lot of the cookie stuff works. And you need to give people, like, they need to be weighted visually, the op option to opt in and opt out. Maybe we could do the same thing with AI is like, just to be aware, this is this could be inaccurate. So you can opt out if you want, or you can carry on and don't do a big, bold, please use AI overviews button and then leave a little tiny opt out button. It's, in the an, it's an education <laughs> thing for me as well. Like, because <clears throat> you could argue the same thing is present in SERPs, right? Like, sure, yeah. Okay, is this website correct? Sure. Who's, who's this person? But I feel like as people, we understand that other people can be wrong and can be incorrect. I think my grievance is that because people trust Google, 
when they just see AI come up, they're like, AI, that's really clever, and it's Google. It's artificial so intelligence. It's, yeah, it's going to be correct. It's got the word intelligence. Yeah, I think their defences are down. So I agree. Yeah, I think yeah. for important stuff like this, it just shouldn't be happening. Just switch it off for money, for health. Just switch it off for now. Yep. Yeah. Make it work properly. I, I find it crazy that they haven't and didn't think of that. Because, like I said, considering how much we as SEOs and how much Google publicly talks about YMYL and specifically referencing. Oh, yeah health-related searches, finance-related searches, all that kind of stuff, and how important that is. Don't just create rubbish content. You've got to really prove yourself, blah, 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 blah. Unless you're us, then sod it. Here's a, here's a thing that might be completely wrong sourced from some random dude who doesn't know what he's talking about. It's crazy to me that I, I think you're right. The, the, the best option would be probably to turn this off for certain categories of queries that come under that kind of YMYL umbrella until either you can get it right or just don't do it at all. Well, we'll see uh, what the leadership change at Google uh, brings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> see what Nick Fox has to say about this. There's an interesting thing we also talked about. Uh, I'll get further into the study in a sec as well, but we talked about the SE ranking study from a couple of weeks ago as well. They were talking about AI overviews. Brilliant stuff again, really, really long, detailed studies. And they had discussed the, the how the, was it the percentage of occurrence of AI overviews based on query type and how that's changed over time mm -hmm. and how it has gone up and up for like informational stuff like how to do this thing and like lots of DIY stuff and all the kind of obvious things you think of that have a fairly straightforward answer yeah. with a bit of wiggle room to yeah. kind of get a few different options. But as we said, when it was coming to the personalized feed stuff we were just talking about and when it comes to this kind of stuff, the more complex and the more nuanced and the more specific you get, if you want to learn about a specific way to invest using this thing with a specific type of company in this state in the US, you're going to bump into problems very quickly because like I said, it's not location based. It's going to serve you up stuff from all over the world and all over the country. And I think from what I remember from the SE ranking study, they did prove that it has gone down for a lot of this kind of stuff. Like Google had realized they've dialed it back a lot, but... Yeah. I think you're right that it probably should be turned off entirely. And to, to highlight how great this study is, like I said, credit to Robert and the team at the College Investor. There's a brilliant little drop down thing where you can explore query by query and categorized by the type of finance they are, which I thought is really clever. And you get little drop down boxes that show the SERP itself and show the AI overview. And they also explain how it's wrong and link to a source explaining why it's wrong, and this is what we suggest as an alternative. It's a brilliant way of demonstrating it, and in a very ha-ha googly kind of way, this is really helpful content that then gives you the correct answers from genuine authoritative sources. This is a, I think this is a brilliant example of an article to, again, allow you to explore further, having these kind of interactive buttons and stuff where you can scroll around, categorizing it by wrong, kind of incorrect and completely incorrect and also categorizing it by type so you can see actually no you should be clicking this link and checking out this thing because this is very outdated this is wrong that's in the wrong state all that kind of stuff this is fantastic stuff and i, I really appreciate the the effort they've gone into properly organize format and structure this stuff to give us literal <laughs> screenshots which i'm sure many <laughs> search publishers and SEO publishers will be using as examples for, for months and months to come of, wow, did you see how bad they got their <laughs> repay repayment plan? Sup? Look at this crazy AI overview and how wrong it is. And yeah. I, this just, is all incorrect. Uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I love how blunt Robert is as well because I can imagine as a person who has invested, huh, pun, uh, invested a lot of time in building up his site, his brand, his career around this kind of thing, giving advice to people about student loans and investments. And all you this mean kind of his stuff. experience, expertise, authority, <laughs> and trust. Ah, <laughs> he's done the double EAT thing, exactly. All of this stuff is so quickly undone by, oh, well, you can imagine the amount of phone calls these, these people who work in legal stuff, financial stuff, all this kind of thing will get like, oh, I searched for this thing and the the conversation robot highlighted on linkedin well this website said i could do the thing yeah. like well i'm telling you you can't and i've studied this thing for years and i've got a degree in the subject i know what i'm talking about this is outdated and like you said like just this is all incorrect is a brilliant way of just being like this is 
not working at all. And I find it really interesting where I guess we're going to see more of this. I would love to see this in other examples of other SERPs and see the kind of percentages. I think this is the first time I've seen a percentage breakdown of wrong, a little bit incorrect, and completely incorrect. Whereas, like I said, I've seen a lot of how often is it served for this type of query? How often are we seeing AI overviews? This is the first time I've seen a question query by query analysis of how accurate actually is this? And yeah, I think it's really interesting. Like I said, go and check out the study in full. I highly, highly recommend it. I might try one of these for uh, for scuba diving. Oh, that's, that's a good I idea. Yeah. So I'll ask it some some detailed questions about how long I can stay underwater and stuff and see what it says. I'll do Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> fifth edition rule set. <laughs> it will definitely start pulling the new D and D rule set stuff. But now I have the player's handbook of that, thanks to you, Mark. So <laughs> I can uh, query that as well. But yeah, I, I think this is. I really, I'd, again, I'd like to see more of this. I appreciate how much effort has gone into this study. So, like I said, go and read it. Credit to Robert and the team for doing this. But I want to see it for kind of other niches and other industries as well. I'd be very interested to see how it works. Let's talk about how it gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Courtesy yes. of Reddit. Oh, yes. Annoyed Redditors tanking Google search results illustrates the perils of oh. AI scrapers. What a headline. And <laughs> I love the, this story. The, subti this the story. subtitle is so good. Spreading misinformation suddenly becomes a noble goal. <laughs> <laughs> if that doesn't sum up Reddit, I don't know what does. It's just the it's the most Reddit headline in the world. Th there are few places on the internet that you want to piss off less than, than Reddit. Yeah. If you upset a specific subreddit, they just tear you to pieces and you're in a lot of trouble. And to briefly summarize this example, this is people giving fake restaurant reviews to other restaurants that they don't care about or don't like so that fewer people go to the ones that they do like so they can actually still book tables and it's not getting like, oh, it's a bunch of tourists at my favorite restaurant. I can't get a table. People are doing fake reviews of other less interesting nearby restaurants and alternatives like, oh, yeah, you should definitely go and check out this Japanese restaurant while I go and have the actual nice one down the road. It, it's crazy, but hilarious. <laughs> what, what I like about this, this story is obviously this is happening outside of the SEO community, right? Mm, this is yeah. just general Redditors. Yeah, this is on Ars Technica, like, which is a, a tech discussion thing yeah and this has happened before um with when google bombing was a thing which yep. was a basically when you used to be able to essentially get a web page to rank for pretty much anything by linking to it with that anchor text and the kind of classic example was the george w bush biography page on the White House website ranked number one for miserable failure <laughs> when the information kind of got out onto Reddit that that's roughly how Google works or Google pays attention for that. So Redditors went away and created loads of links on forums on their own little blogs to this page so Google decided that's what it was yep, about. Yep. And you know, over the years, Google um, introduced updates to kind of stop stuff like that happening. Um, and this is why I think we're in a particularly interesting phase of kind of search SEO now, which is I wouldn't say that Google has had that many ways to have the layman on mass kind yeah. of exploit it so easily. And because AI overviews are just hoovering up stuff that they find now, yep. it's become public knowledge that, oh, hang on a minute. If we all just go and say a thing, <laughs> then that's what's going to going to be surfaced and you know I was having a discussion actually with a Googler the other day talking about how prominent Reddit is in general yes. in the SERPs yeah. and I said you know even even if which I don't think is even if you thought that was a good idea it will be ruined because SEO people are like oh it's re it's okay I'm just going to go and shill all over that website and just ruin it and yeah. cover it in affiliate uh, stuff and eventually it will be degraded right as soon as a Google a person confirms anything like well that's getting spammed to death yeah. then I guess like yeah so and this is what's going to happen unless they change now how AI overviews work yeah. because it's just I think it's too much of a tempting target for groups of people that just like spreading a little bit of chaos yep. online and there's lots of chaos gremlins yep um to Especially just on Reddit. <laughs> yeah, to just manipulate anything. You yeah. know? And if, if this works, so they're, you know, having Angus Steakhouse come up 
saying how wonderful it is, that's going to start happening for people, for companies that they don't like. Um, you'll see, you know, people getting doxxed and yep. personal information getting stuffed into AI overviews. And then, you know, I think Google's got a very big problem because it's not like it's some small AI tool where there's a quaint thing happening and everyone can laugh at it. It's yeah. like millions of people see these results, right? Yep, absolutely. It's a really, I'll, I'll scroll back up here just to uh, kind of cover. Specifically in London, they were getting annoyed by influencers showing up. And as soon as an influence shows up, a whole queue of people will show up because, oh, it's blown up on TikTok. And then that's how the internet works now. So not even when you're getting AI overviews, the, the author discusses here, I searched for specific things in London around steakhouses, couldn't get an AI overview. However, when I searched for best steak sandwich in London, the top result was Reddit. And it's a bunch of people saying, man, yeah, you should really go and check out Angus Steakhouse. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? This is the best sandwich I've ever had, picture of Angus Steakhouse. Even without the AI overview stuff, it ties into Google's relationship with Reddit, as you were just saying there. Like, this is such a clear, easy manipulation that, I, again, coming back around to the YMYL stuff we were just talking about, like, how did they not see this coming? Did we really not, like, plan for any of this? Like, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't do AI overviews for a bunch of, like, really important topics where people might, like, I don't know, lose their entire life savings <laughs> or no longer be able to go to college or whatever. And on the other side of this, like, so we're going to pull just a bunch of data from Reddit, right? It's like, yes. That can't surprise you, though. You know Reddit is full of nutters and chaos gremlins, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, what's your point? Like, so now we have glue in our pizza and nobody goes to this restaurant. Like, <laughs> do you not oh, remember when we discussed Google Notes? Absolutely, yeah, like, yeah. It's so mad. this doesn't surprise me. How do they me? not learn anything? Like, That's what I'm saying. We, we just we've let... talked about this so many times on this podcast <laughs> yeah. alone. We'll just let people write on the search results. They'll write useful things won't they my ass hurts etc <laughs> yeah. yeah one so, of the, one of our yeah. most viral clips on on linkedin <laughs> was my ass hurts and you and i talking about the the notes because who like this is my new ass hurts <laughs> St steakhouse in london is your new ass yes yeah. yeah, uh, there's a nice little write-up here from the author talking about uh depending on user-generated content and i think that's a really interesting kind of point to end on because so many of us have been talking about the positives of user-generated content, right? Like, I know Crystal Carter recently did a talk at Search Norwich. That'll be up on the Search Norwich YouTube channel. Hopefully by the time you hear this, around that sort of time later next week, I'll put a link and, and update the link so you can go and check out Crystal's great talk talking about how important it is to use user data to humanize stuff even when you're creating content with AI. And, for example, the Reddit CEO here is talking about low quality, shallow content generated by AI, all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, sure. But you can humanize that by bringing in actual customer interviews, actual data, going to your reviewers and having a conversation with talking to your sales team, all this kind of stuff. There's so much other data you can bring in to make your content unique and helpful and specific to your customers yeah. and your users. However, this turns into the negative side of user generated content. Because it's like, well, yeah, you need to trust your users and trust the customers are saying what they believe in and all those reviews are legit. Except, as you said, Mark, there has been a history of people review bombing stuff since internet immemorial. Like, this has happened forever. There's films, video games, anything will get review bombed because, oh, it has a woman in the lead role yeah. or anything like that. I don't trust reviews online much anymore. My wife, every time you mentioned buying stuff on Amazon earlier, like every time my wife would be like, but what are the reviews like? I'm like, I don't know. I don't look at them. Only nutters review stuff on Amazon. <laughs> Do you know anyone who reviews stuff on Amazon? No, you don't. They're psychos. <laughs> and half of the bloody reviews are, looks great, haven't opened the package yet, five stars. I'm like, don't leave a bloody review then. That's not helpful. And all of this stuff then feeds into like, oh, it's the era of UGC and we, we're giving the power back to the users. Like, people are mad <laughs> and wrong and trolls and chaos goblins. Don't trust people. Have we not learned anything from, oh, I don't know, the last 10,000 years of human history? Wikipedia is pretty good, though. Yeah, because you can't edit it publicly now. You need to register and properly. It's pretty good. Yeah. It's pretty it good. was chaos for a little bit. And a lot of people just, some some people's like, 
died on Wikipedia. And I was like, I didn't die. Some, <laughs> my mate just changed my Wikipedia page, lol. Like, if there's an opportunity for chaos, internet users are yeah. going to do that. And I wonder if this is, again, it feels like the push and pull of kind of talk to your users and get user-generated stuff, which I totally agree with and totally believe in. But also, don't feed the trolls. Don't trust the trolls. <laughs> Reddit is full of crazy people who want to mess with yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. I don't think just trust Reddit is a long-term <laughs> business strategy. Don't don't trust Reddit <laughs> in big, bold letters. In the, is that Google's new... Uh, don't do don't evil. Be, don't, don't be, be evil. evil. Just trust Reddit. <laughs> Just trust Reddit. <laughs> oh, that's a good dear. place to end. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Googlers. <laughs> <laughs> Learning to trust Reddit. Uh, but yes, like I said, I'll put links for everything in the video description or the show notes down below, wherever you're watching or listening to this episode. Like I said, go and check out all these articles. Especially recommend that study in all the detail. You can go and look at all the specific queries and stuff like that read all the Google announcements and things like that as well. I also put links to go and follow Mark. And once we get like details and slides and all that kind of stuff, you can follow Mark flying around the world doing talks about this kind of stuff as well. If you want to follow us, we are Search for the Canda on everything. Come and find us, search on YouTube, Spotify, all that kind of stuff. On the socials, we're just Canda. But if you can like, subscribe, leave a five-star review on Spotify, all that kind of stuff, considering how many times I've just talk badly about people leaving reviews online please leave us a review yeah any <laughs> now we're psychos gonna get... <laughs> this thing as you put it leave us a review um... we're gonna get review bombed on spotify oh no <laughs> <laughs> to be fair one of my most prized possessions is a one-star review of my other podcast on apple podcasts which is just like a bunch of woke idiots don't know what they're talking about. One star. It's like, yeah. Nice. I use that as an Instagram ad for the last <laughs> couple of times. Um, but yes, like I said, please do like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Share the podcast around. And Mark and I will be back hopefully more soon than seven weeks between more episodes. Sooner, for sure. More sooner next time. <laughs> In the meantime, I'll have lots of interviews and conversations. I've got chats with Noah Lerner and Marco Giordano coming up in the next couple nice. of weeks. Two of my favorite people to learn from in SEO. Two super duper smart people. And we're talking all about critical thinking skills and how they apply to learning SEO, developing yourself as an SEO with Noah, and talking about how to handle and communicate your web data to stakeholders with Marco Giordano as well. All that coming up in the next couple of weeks. And we'll be back in about three or four weeks, hopefully, usually something like that, with more SEO news. In the meantime, please do go and subscribe to Core Updates. You can go to coreupdates.com. That is our weekly news update. You can get straight to your inbox every single Monday. It also includes these episodes of the podcast. You're now solicited, because you got it in your inbox, exactly. SEO tips from, from your LinkedIn posts. And eight to 10-ish kind of, uh, of the most important SEO news topics every single Monday morning. Well, we will say goodbye, and I'll see you next week. Goodbye.